we transform it into sugar, fuel, plastic, and enough food stuff to fill a supermarket. It doesn't exist naturally. Corn is entirely a man-made phenomenon. We grow it on the farm, in a lab, or even underground. On the cob, in a can, in a sack, or in a silo. It's a worldwide gold rush. Ethanol is about ready to take over as the number one user of corn in the United States. Now, corn on Modern Marvels. Corn is the largest agricultural crop in the United States. Fields of corn cover more than 80 million acres of land. That's an area larger than the state of New Mexico. Pass that corn on the cob. It's the delicious treat we call sweet corn. Lakeside Foods in Wisconsin has been processing sweet corn for over 100 years. Here, corn is king. This is where corn comes to get canned. And to make sure your sweet corn stays sweet, it's an all-out war against the clock, starting with the instant it's harvested. The critical time for processing is within five or six hours. We want to retain the sweetness of the corn. We don't want the sugars to turn to starch by being delayed in harvest. This is the first part of the process as we've had the corn weighed. We're loading it on the dock. Now we're starting to push it into a conveyor vibrating conveyor. This vibrating conveyor system causes the cobs to continually rotate, so the weight of the cob doesn't damage the kernels resting on the belt. Once inside the processing plant, the sweet ears of corn journey into a carnival of precision automation. As the corn comes into the corn room, we're going into the husker. The husker has six lanes. As the lanes are separated by a series of neoprene and rubber rolls. What the rolls are doing in opposite directions are stripping the silk and the husk material off the ear of corn. Then it goes into a conveyor to further process. On average, in an hour, we're processing approximately 35 tons of corn out of the four huskers. Surprisingly, almost all of the delicate corn kernels remain intact after this seemingly violent step. Next stop, the cutter. Ears must be positioned in the correct direction to meet the fast and furious razor-sharp blades. Each cutter has a separate cutting head, which includes six blades. These blades are moved by a head in a gear system, which will open and close depending on the taper of the ear. Like magic, the ear goes in, and out come perfect corn kernels, still in a race to their ultimate destination. The cob will join the husks and silks on their own conveyor, bound to become part of a smorgasbord for livestock. As we convey the kernels over to the next piece of equipment, it is a shaker, which actually is separating kernels and is removing pieces of cob, shank, husk material that may still be in the product screen. Next, a series of wet washers and air cleaners propel the corn into the inspection area. Cameras reject bad kernels as they fly by at 600 feet per minute, and human inspectors perform a final screening. After the kernels leave inspection, they're submerged in a flume of hot water that kills bacteria and raises the corn's temperature in anticipation of the cooking process. Now the sweet kernels are ready for the can. The critical quality control program is to maintain a certain headspace in the can. We need a temperature of a minimum of 80 degrees before this goes to the cooker. We also need a maximum fill weight of 10.7 ounces. So those are critical factors in the operation of filling and seaming this can. In the cooker, the kernels bounce inside each spiraling can in 225 degree heat for 16 minutes. 380 cans per minute enter the cooker. The result, perfect corn in hermetically sealed cans with a shelf life of at least three years. Total time elapsed from its arrival at Lakeside? 25 minutes. This Lakeside production plant will process approximately 40,000 tons of corn 
in 60 days or less. Each year in the United States, almost 3 million tons of sweet corn are canned, frozen, and packaged. That is a lot of corn. But here's the surprise. It represents less than 1% of all commercial corn grown in the United States. So what's growing in all those corn fields? It's called dent corn. So named for a physical dimple on the end of the kernel. Sweet corn is best when it's full of moisture and eaten right off the cob. But dent, commonly known as field corn, is just the opposite. The U.S. grows almost 364 million tons of field corn per year. That's about 110 pounds for every person on the planet. Field corn is an ingredient in over 3,000 foodstuffs on the grocery store shelf. You'll find it in everything from breakfast cereals to soda, to the batter on fish sticks, and even yogurt and ice cream. Every box of cornflakes contains 97% corn, and the cornmeal surrounding a corn dog is a fine grind of dent kernels. Corn starch sticks energy bars together, and corn oil will fry your chicken. It's all field corn. And more than 15% of America's field corn is shipped around the globe. Corn is the most important crop in the world. Farmers produce more corn than any other crop by a pretty long shot. Wheat comes in kind of second, but kind of distant to corn. And the United States produces 40% of the world's corn. In fact, a single U.S. corn farmer provides enough food and fiber for 143 people. But as much corn as humans eat, it's animals that chow down most of it. More than 70% of the annual corn crop will go to feed livestock. But field corn and sweet corn aren't the only kernels on the cob. Perhaps the corn with the most fun appeal is a little delicacy called popcorn. We believe that the oldest kind of corn is popcorn. And that has a hard starch. It also has to have an intact covering around the outside of it in order for it to actually be able to build up steam inside the corn and have the corn pop to make a flake. Popcorn stores water in tiny pockets of soft starch. As the kernel is heated, the water turns to steam, and the hard outer surface withstands the pressure as long as possible. Then. Pop goes the corn. Popcorn comprises less than 2% of the United States corn crop and is grown in 25 states. But almost all U.S. corn is grown in the Corn Belt, which consists of 12 states in the Midwest. Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and Iowa produce 50% of America's total corn supply. Iowa is number one. It's very well adapted to the United States, especially the Corn Belt here in, in the Midwest. Uh, it's really a tropical crop, warm season crop, but the growing season here, the precipitation, the rainfall that we get, the amount of light that we get, all those things combine to just be a, a, a wonderful, perfect environment for it to grow in. But no matter where corn grows, adaptation and versatility have made it for some the 21st century's gold. That's partly because it's not just for food. You'll find corn in over 400 non-food items, from adhesives to explosives. There are a huge number of uses. And what a lot of people don't understand is, in terms of starch, there's more starch used in consumer goods, what we call bio-based products, than there is as food. Two-thirds of the starch sold as starch ends up in things like charcoal briquettes, adhesives, paper, plastics. Plastics? We think of plastic as a petroleum-based product. But corn will do the job, too. NatureWorks in Blair, Nebraska, is a leader in the technology of transforming plant sugars into performance plastics. It's the first company to produce plastic from a 100% annually renewable resource. 
It's a new biopolymer called polylactic acid, or PLA, that shares its name with the company that makes it, NatureWorks. We can produce a crop of corn in about 100 days, not 100 million years. The production process for planting a seed of corn to making PLA has a much smaller environmental footprint than oil-based plastics. We have reduced the consumption of fossil fuels by 65%, and we produce 80 to 90% less greenhouse gases than oil-based processes. Field corn is put through a milling process that separates the starch, oil, and protein. Enzymes added to the starch convert it to a type of sugar called dextrose. The dextrose is then fermented with yeast to produce lactic acid. A proprietary process removes excess water and crystallizes the lactic acid into the NatureWorks biopolymer. Within a matter of days of a corn kernel being received on this site, and the corn milling operation is converted into the NatureWorks plastic. This bioplastic is shipped in resin form to customers around the globe. The resin is then converted into this family of products you see here on this table. Everything from a plastic that can be used to make a gift card, to a clear food container, to a foam type product. We also have drink cups. The fiber made from PLA is real soft and easily printable. You see some shirts and other types of garments here behind me. It's easily identified by the NatureWorks logo. And this bioplastic costs about the same to produce as petroleum-based plastics, while decomposing in as little as 40 to 80 days when composted properly. For companies like Wilkinson Industries, making plastic food containers starts when the NatureWorks bioplastic is sent through an extruder where it melts into a sheet of clear plastic. Cooled and measured for thickness, it's wound onto rolls and sent to a heating and shaping machine called the thermoformer. Lots of the material exits the oven and goes into the mold assembly where the mold comes in contact with the material. It goes to the top and from the bottom. An air pressure and vacuum system force the plastic into the mold. And seconds later, the plastic piece is complete. The finished containers are boxed and shipped, ready to appear on a deli or bakery shelf near you. Corn may be the holy grail for plastic, but exploiting its full potential is still on the horizon. Under high heat, NatureWorks performance is compromised. So for the time being, you won't find it on a car bumper or on the space shuttle. What you're looking at here is really the first generation of NatureWorks polymers. Uh, we continue to do research and continue to expand the breadth of application. 21st century corn is a marvel of science and agriculture. But it didn't start out that way. From the grasslands of Mexico to the mapping of its genome, corn has undergone an amazing transformation. And to create super corn is the next leap for both man and kernel. For 180 days, these wild-looking green stalks will flourish under the North American sky. But the irony is that corn is anything but wild. Corn has been domesticated, which means it can't grow without human intervention. And not just some corn, but all of it, every kernel. There are no natural populations of corn like we normally see in an Iowa cornfield. It doesn't exist naturally. Corn is entirely a man-made phenomenon. If we weren't here to plant, water, fertilize, and harvest it, corn would disappear from the planet within a few years. The hypothetical scenario would go something like this. An ear of corn falls to the ground. Each seed or kernel struggles to germinate. The tightly packed seeds rob each other of vital nutrients. Such brutal competition chokes most, if not all, successful reproduction. But corn will continue to thrive as long as farmers nurture it. And companies like Pioneer Hybrid are on the job. For almost a century, 
Pioneer has used science to create better corn. As one of the largest seed producers in the world, they ship corn seed to every continent except Antarctica. This is a seed crop and not a grain crop, so we bring it in and carefully handle it to preserve the integrity of that crop so that when the farmer plants it, the following spring meets all expectations that both we and our farmer customers have. Corn is really an incredible crop. It's really dynamic in terms of what we can do with it to improve its characteristics. One way Pioneer works with corn is through plant breeding and the use of hybrid corn. When we talk about hybrid corn, which is really all the corn that we're using in modern society today, it's all hybrid. So it starts with two individual parents that are specifically mated to create great offspring, and those are hybrids. Hybrids are the combination of two distinct strains of corn, each with its own unique characteristics. One might have a very large ear, and the other may have a very tall stalk. Individually, these strains are known as inbreds. Crossing these two inbreds together creates a hybrid. And hybrids often exhibit heterosis, which means they are better than their parents. This complex biological phenomenon of heterosis is the cornerstone of today's corn industry. The wonderful thing for the seed companies is that if you collect the seed from a hybrid and plant it again, it doesn't have the same degree of superior performance as the hybrid itself. So growers have to go back to the seed company to buy hybrid seed again. That's actually a good thing, because seed companies have an incentive to invest in research and development. What modern day plant breeders did was they improved the plant's ability to withstand water stress, nitrogen deficiency, nutrient deficiency, temperature stress, uh, insect attack, or disease attack. It may all look like modern science, but the breeding of corn really started thousands of years ago in central Mexico. But back then, corn looked a lot different. In fact, it didn't exist. It began as a wild grass called teosinti, which only has a few small kernels and no real cob. It's an extraordinary feat, the evolution, the domestication of a crop. Um, I'm not sure if we decided to domesticate corn now, whether we could actually muster the will as a society to do this. It's one of the real gifts of our ancestors to us. In fact, scientists continue to study the Teosinti plant to unlock its evolutionary secrets. They have discovered that there's just a handful of genes responsible for the major morphological changes between teosinte and corn. For example, the big one was the separation of the tassel from the ear. They probably saw mutations out in teosinte fields that had the ear and tassel separate, and they selected for those. They, they may have noticed that they yielded more or had some other characteristic they were looking for. The tassel, which produces the pollen, is separated from the ear, which contains the egg cells that develop into kernels after pollination. The corn plant could and still can pollinate itself as well as surrounding corn plants. The Native Americans achieved the Herculean task of turning teosinti into corn. And they did it without a powerful and controversial modern scientific tool, genetic modification. If you talk about genetically modified corn, they would also be hybrids, but they're a special classification of a regulated product because we've brought in one single or maybe a few genes from another species to help us do something very specific in the plant. The revolution started in 1996 with what has become known as BT corn. The BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis, a naturally occurring bacteria. This bacterium contains a protein toxic to one of corn's biggest enemies, the European corn borer. We express that protein in corn in a way that when the insect pest actually fed on the corn, it died as a result of taking that first bite. The corn borer has the ability to destroy millions of acres of corn. But because of the BT trait, 
the economic damage this pest can cause has nearly been eliminated. Genetic modification is an exacting laboratory science in which DNA from one plant or animal is transferred into the embryo of another. Pioneer Hybrid has over 300 corn hybrids available for farmers in North America. Many are insect resistant, defying bugs like the western bean cutworm that attacks the ear, and the western corn rootworm beetle larvae that attack the roots. In Pioneer's so-called fast corn greenhouse, the company has accelerated their evaluation of genetically engineered corn. In one month, we'd actually test about 1,000 corn plants, carrying about 100 different candidates to be traits. When those get harvested, new ones show up the next week with new traits to be tested. While future corn will certainly start in the lab, the genetically modified seed will have to be grown in test plots. Its cultivation near commercial cornfields is heavily restricted since wind carries the corn's pollen. If untested, genetically altered crops could cross-pollinate with corn bound for the food supply. The result could prove economically disastrous and potentially harmful. Scenarios might include massive food recalls, unknown medical reactions in the general public, and crop loss. In the case of plant-derived pharmaceuticals, standard greenhouses aren't secure enough to grow certain seeds. So what about growing corn where the sun doesn't shine and the temperature always stays the same? We are driving into the Marengo Warehouse and Distribution Center deep in the hills of southern Indiana. We're literally driving into the side of a cliff, and up above us is about 160 feet of rock. This was once an active limestone mine that has subsequently been converted into a working warehouse. In the limestone caves, the temperature never fluctuates more than a few degrees. Sunlight never enters here, nor do any insects or animals. In this unlikely setting, founder Doug Ozenbaugh has created a contained atmosphere to grow any kind of corn for any purpose. It's called Controlled Farming Ventures, a blank slate to create any environment. And it all begins in the 2,000 square foot test facility. For instance, if somebody was trying to develop a more drought resistant line of corn and they came upon a, a valuable discovery on, say, January the 5th with 12 inches of snow outside here in Indiana, we can give them an, a 95 degree day with 20% humidity and we can do that every day for the next three months while they test their crop, and I can guarantee you that you're not gonna get an emergency rain to screw up your experiment. Ozenbaugh's underground ideas started in response to pharmaceutical research. The goal, grow plants with special proteins for the safer, faster, and cheaper manufacturing of life-saving drugs. We've been able to design a system in a facility for about the same price as a greenhouse that enables you to really control all of the important variables that affect plant growth. A growth chamber for the 21st century. Controlled farming ventures puts corn into an alien world and makes it thrive. But back above ground, what happens to all that corn that grows every summer? How does it get into our cereal, muffins, and donuts? American farmers produce more than 364 million tons of corn each year. That's enough to carpet 130,000 square miles with kernels. We're farming here and been in the business 47 years. We start planting our corn in April. We always hope to be done by May 10th. That's a target date that we've set for ourselves, hoping that our yields will be better in the fall harvest. This year, the Wingers family farm in central Wisconsin teams with 1,800 acres of corn. Not a kernel of it is the sweet corn destined to end up on your dinner table. 
It's dent corn, part of the 80 million acres that will be processed into everything from cereal to rat poison. That is, if it doesn't explode. During the September harvest, they store some right in their own backyard. In those three grain bands behind me, we can store around 250,000 bushel. There's not enough corn storage at a commercial elevator to store it all for a whole year's supply. So you need to store your own corn. And then at times of the year when the market is better, you can take advantage of that. When the wingers are ready to sell, one buyer is just down the road. Didion Milling has been grinding corn for 35 years. Each truckload Kelly Wingers delivers holds four acres worth of kernels. And its first destination is a giant dryer. That dryer has a series of burners and high pressure fans in the bottom. So the corn is actually in a layer between what we call skins, two skins. And the corn gets fed into the top and travels toward the bottom while hot air gets pushed up and out through the corn. We run the burners at about 180 degrees. Keeping the corn dry not only keeps it from spoiling too fast, but also from becoming a deadly hazard. If you have wet corn that's sitting in a silo very long, that's a perfect temperature to grow bacteria. So that bacteria, as it eats the corn, it creates heat. And that heat will eventually get to a critical mass where you can actually have a fire if you don't store the corn properly, if it's too wet. And with 21 silos that each hold the equivalent of 200 truckloads of corn, keeping this powder keg of kernels cool is a challenge. Disasters like this 1998 grain elevator explosion in Wichita, Kansas, that killed two people are a tragic example of the potential dangers. Corn can be kept for up to a year if the storage conditions are proper. So all these silos are equipped with aeration fans where we push cubic feet of air up through the corn, and that keeps the corn from having temperature spikes. These concrete monsters are as tall as a 12-story building. It takes two square miles of corn to fill just one silo. Corn is sent down this gravity chute into the mill system, and the first step it goes through there is the corn cleaning. Once cleaned, the kernels are cut into small pieces and sent through a complex system of sifters and air pressure chambers on their way to the grinding machines. In each grinding machine, two metal cylinders are positioned side by side and rotate toward each other at different speeds. Each cylinder has grooves, which will determine how fine the grind will be. The end products that come out of all this process would be corn flour, which is the finest material that we ship. And which might end up in the batter of your buffalo wings, or even in your donut. They also produce cornmeal that could cover your English muffin, or fill your corn chip and even coarser cornmeal you can find on the bottom of a pizza. And when that coarse cornmeal is cooked, it'll puff up and get processed into your favorite cereals. Even as this corn can be turned into food, its sticky characteristics make it a perfect binder to hold together such products as porcelain sinks and even rat poison pellets. Whether Didion's milled corn becomes a goodie you eat or a product you use, they ship it to clients around the world via truck and rail. We're actually inside a railroad car right now. So the bags that you see coming across are coming directly off the packaging lines. These bags each weigh about 55 pounds, and a bushel of corn weighs about 56 pounds. The railroad car will hold uh, between 2,500 and 2,700 of these bags. And that equates to an average tonnage of about 67 to 70 metric tons per railroad car. This loading is just the start of a global transportation phenomenon that literally helps feed the world. In collaboration with the United States Department of Agriculture, 
Didion Milling is one of the largest suppliers of U.S. food aid to countries in need. They ship approximately 130,000 metric tons of a cornmeal-based, nutrient-rich food product that provides essential calories to sustain life. The same Midwestern corn nourishing the masses now also feeds our gas tanks. The ethanol craze is here. But is there enough corn to fuel ourselves and our cars? A near endless line of semi trucks filled to the brim with a bounty of gold kernels. This is the entrance to Verisun Energy's ethanol production plant in Charles City, Iowa, opened in 2007. By the end of the decade, more than 200 ethanol biorefineries will dot the landscape from Washington State to Georgia. Ethanol is a biofuel that reduces tailpipe carbon monoxide emissions by up to 30%. Ethanol is about ready to take over as the number one user of corn in the United States. Converting corn to ethanol isn't that complicated. But to mass produce hundreds of thousands of gallons per day requires a detailed, coordinated, and streamlined system. Where we're at now is the starting point where everything begins. The corn comes in through here. A truck will weigh about 80,000 when it's full, which is about 30,000 for the truck and about 50,000 pounds of corn. If you're doing the math, that adds up to 45 million pounds of corn a week. Speed through here is very important. Typically, when the time a truck pulls onto the scale, we sample it, weigh it, and the truck pulls off, is less than a minute. Once the corn is okayed, the truck rolls over to the offloading area, where it dumps its precious cargo into a pit. From the pit, the corn travels up a grain leg, where it flows into the top of the silos. We have four silos together. They hold about 2.2 million bushels of corn. We have a small fifth silo here uh, where we actually uh, screen the corn, get any impurities out, and we actually grind the corn into a corn flour. Behind me is our hammer mills. That's where we grind our corn. We have a dry mill process. Once the corn is ground into a flour, we send it over a conveyor where it enters our process. We grind about 120,000 bushels of corn a day. Conveyors move the corn flour into the cook area, where it's soaked with water and enzymes, which break down the corn starch into sugar. For hundreds of years, this basic process has also been used to ferment alcohol and make liquor, like corn whiskey. Now called mash, it cooks at 225 degrees Fahrenheit to kill any bacteria. The corn mash then cools and travels to an 800,000 gallon fermentation tank, one of seven where yeast is added. You can't make alcohol without yeast. The yeast eat the sugar, and one of their byproducts is the, the ethanol. After 48 hours of fermenting, it's termed beer, although you wouldn't want to drink it. After fermentation, one of the most important processes in ethanol production is actually purifying the ethanol. We do that behind me. We have three distillation columns. The first one is what we call a beer column. We actually separate the alcohol from the solids. The mash runs through a series of metal plates and under high heat emits a water and alcohol vapor that rises and moves through two additional distillation columns to purify the alcohol to 190 proof. The final step sends the vapor to a molecular sieve. There, the water and alcohol vapors are separated as the water is captured and absorbed by millions of small clay pellets. What's left is 200 proof pure alcohol. Contrary to what you may think, ethanol isn't anything new. Ironically, it was ethanol that fueled Henry Ford's early Model T, the first flexible fuel vehicle. And Ford might be surprised that after 100 years, ethanol is in the alternative fuel category. 
critics question, is ethanol really environmentally friendly? To grow the corn and convert it to ethanol requires nitrogen for fertilizer and diesel equipment on the farms, as well as natural gas at the processing plant. Some experts estimate that it takes one gallon of fossil fuel to produce 1.3 gallons of ethanol. Still, there are already nearly 6 million flexible fuel vehicles traveling America's roads. They're called flexible because these cars are able to use either unleaded gasoline or the current ethanol standard, E85. E85 releases 80% less carcinogens, such as benzene, into the air than unleaded gasoline. In 2006, ethanol use in the U.S. reduced CO2 equivalent greenhouse gas emissions by approximately 8 million tons. That's equal to removing the annual emissions of more than 1.2 million cars. But is there enough corn to feed us and fuel our cars? We're not going to run out of corn. We have plenty of corn to go around. And if we start running out of corn, the price will go up and farmers will plant more acres to corn. Detractors, however, point out that this will mean less acreage available for other crops. Nevertheless, the corn ethanol story has an extremely useful co-product. Dried distiller's grains are the portions of corn that can't be fermented, but they contain highly valued nutrients for livestock. This is where we actually process the distiller's grain and dry the distiller's grain out. The solids come out into a conveying system that takes it through two big rotary drum dryers where we remove all the 10% of the water. So we have a 90% dry solid product. If you can see this, this is a mixture of protein, fiber, and oil. This is what the animals want. This has always been viewed probably prior to this industry as a waste product, but now it's just a viable product that we use in the feed industry. It takes a mere 65 hours to both process a kernel of corn into ethanol and ready it for shipping by rail. And it only took about 100 days for the corn to grow. Much of that corn is hybridized, specifically to get the ethanol to fossil fuel ratio higher. But in the future, it may be possible to convert even the corn stalks, leaves, and husks into ethanol fuel through the science of cellulosic technology. The US government is investing um, hundreds of millions of dollars in research to try to figure out that question. Will cellulosic feedstocks uh, play an important role in fueling our transportation, uh, our cars and, and buses? We don't know yet. For now, kernels in our gas tanks fuel our cars. But corn converts to another fuel that may not be so good for us. In soda, candy, and about 2,000 other foods, it's sugar made from corn, AKA high fructose corn syrup. The soft drink industry generates almost $48 billion a year. Americans consume more than 15 billion gallons of its drinks. But what does soda have to do with corn? It's all about the sugar. On average, corn-based sweeteners comprise more than 50% of the U.S. sweetener market. And the most prevalent of all is that super sweet substance, high fructose corn syrup. Corn syrup can be found in an incredible array of your pantry's products. Everything from simple ketchup, to mayonnaise, to sports drinks, to salad dressings. Not to mention ice cream, bread, and even baby formula. But there's a downside to the deliciousness. Some have targeted high fructose corn syrup as a prime catalyst fueling America's growing problem with obesity. High fructose corn syrup is manufactured from field corn through a process known as wet milling. The ultimate goal is to isolate the starch present in the kernels, since that's the stuff that will convert to sugar. The first step then in wet milling then is to take this corn 
and add it to an acidic solution of water. And this softens the grain so that when we go to mill it, what we want to do is keep that germ in as large a particle as possible. Like the yolk of an egg, the germ is the embryo and contains oil, while the starch resides elsewhere in the kernel. Here, a specially equipped blender grinds the corn and water solution without damaging the germ. Once blended, the germ will float to the surface because of its high oil content. The isolated germ can then be squeezed to a pulp, and its corn oil will eventually wind up in your frying pan. The remaining portions of the kernel get finely ground. After filtering out the fiber, the liquid and starch separate in a settling trough. The result, 99.7% pure cornstarch, which is then processed on the molecular level into both fructose and glucose sugars. The combination of these sugars results in both corn syrup and high fructose corn syrup. The best way to think of it is a blend of different sugars combined with enzymes to make a liquid. It's plenty sweet. For example, you could eat this entire plate of apples. Six of these apples would equal the sweetening power of this little bit of high fructose corn syrup that is so nutritionally bereft of value. High fructose corn syrup has made its way into thousands of packaged food items. And some experts believe its chemical structure may trick the body in harmful ways. The theory is that high fructose corn syrup depresses the production of hormones that regulate our appetite. So we are actually less responsive biologically to the chemical messengers that tell our body to stop eating. And that's something regular table sugar doesn't do. But some argue there are other factors that contribute to America's weight not just high fructose corn syrup. It deals with calorie intake, it deals with exercise, it deals with a whole gamut of nutrition. So people who are blaming one particular product I th feel is erroneous and a wrong thing to do. The dilemma is that it's likely to remain a cheap and pervasive ingredient for years to come. Now the problem is that there are no commercially economical solutions to replace high fructose corn syrup. So with corn, it seems that every kernel is filled with promise, debate, and power. From super corn to biofuel to feeding the masses, what we choose to do with this golden opportunity might just take us to a field of dreams.